You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. A Federal Judicial Center program. Bankruptcy Law Update. And now here's our moderator, Dean Lawrence Poneroff of the Tulane University Law School. Hello and welcome to the Federal Judicial Television Network's Bankruptcy Law Update program. Today we've invited three of the country's leading bankruptcy law academics to join us in talking about topics and issues we believe you'll find interesting and useful. Professor Laura Bartel of Wayne State University School of Law is going to clue us in on the intricacies of an important federal law that we may not have been paying enough attention to in the practice of bankruptcy. Professor Michelle Dickerson, who teaches in the law school at the College of William and Mary, will discuss the potential bankruptcy application of some legal devices more commonly associated with criminal practice. And last, but certainly not least, Professor Bruce Markell, from the William S. Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and a previous guest on this show, will discuss the increasingly important issue of asset securitization in bankruptcy. Thank you all for coming today. Laura, why don't we begin with you. During the last recession, as opposed to the current one, in 1988, I believe, Congress passed an act known as the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act appropriately called WARN, which if I understand it correctly, requires employers to give 60 days notice to employees of planned closings or mass layoffs. Um, needless to say, companies that are thinking about mass layoffs or planned closings are often companies that may be having some financial problems and later find themselves in, for example, Chapter 11. Uh, so the question that we'd like to start off with is what is the relationship of the WARN notice requirements in bankruptcy? Apparently there's some case law on this now, a Department of Labor interpretation, and uh, as the author of a recent article on the subject, you are the leading expert, so bring us in on it. Well, it's first important to understand that the WARN Act was not enacted because of troubled companies. What Congress was really responding to was the fear that companies would close down operations in the United States and move them offshore to, to enable them to access cheaper labor. In fact, the problem of financially troubled companies was not a major focus of Congress when it was crafting the WARN Act. There are provisions in the WARN Act that may in fact have application to financially troubled companies. But the WARN Act itself does not distinguish between financially troubled companies and other companies that choose to engage in plant closings or mass layoffs. Now, I said that there are some provisions that may have particular applicability to troubled companies. In particular, there are exceptions that reduce the amount of notice that needs to be given by companies in certain circumstances. There are three in particular that may have applicability to financially troubled companies. The first is colloquially called the faltering company exception, where Congress was concerned that the notice itself might prevent a company that was in financial difficulty from obtaining needed business or needed capital that, if it were obtained, would prevent the need to close down a plant or to lay off people. So there is that exception, which may in fact have applicability to financially troubled companies. There is also another exception that is known as the unforeseeable business circumstances exception, where there is something that happens dramatically and unexpectedly in the business environment, such as the withdrawal of a needed contract that, that prompts the company to close down very suddenly. There is also a natural disaster exception, so that if there's a flood or an earthquake or something that, that uh, damages a plant, 
and it, that may result in the company being forced to lay off people very suddenly. But in all of those circumstances, the company is required to give as much notice as possible, even if that's less than 60 days. But none of those exceptions are specifically aimed at bankrupt companies. So if I'm understanding you correctly, an entity filing bankruptcy, the mere filing of the bankruptcy does not exempt the company from the WARN requirements if they otherwise apply. Exactly right. Now, when the Department of Labor, which was statutorily authorized to adopt implementing regulations under the WARN Act, was crafting its final rule, it received a comment on its interim rule suggesting that, of course, bankruptcy fiduciaries should not be subject to the requirements of the WARN Act. And the Department of Labor, in response to this comment, said, no, we can't agree with that. However, we do agree that a fiduciary whose sole function in the bankruptcy process is the liquidation of the business is not an employer in the usual sense because they're not engaged in business and therefore this liquidating fiduciary is not subject to the WARN Act. By contrast, a fiduciary who is continuing to operate the business in bankruptcy is subject to the Warren Act requirements. All right, well, I'm going to have to ask you your opinion of, of that distinction that the Department of Labor has drawn in, in a moment, but um, I, I'd like to be clear on one point initially. The Warren Act only applies to statutorily defined employers, is that correct? And, and is that tied to a minimum number of employees or an asset level? How do you become subject to the Act? The definition of employer is a business enterprise, and that is a term that is not defined in the WARN Act, that employs a hundred or more employees that are essentially full-time employees. So there is a, you have to be a big enough mm -hmm. business enterprise to even be subject to the WARN Act. And then there are additional limitations in the definition of plant closing and mass layoff, so that if you do not lay off enough people, you are not going to be subject to the WARN Act. Okay, so if I am a employer within the meaning of the act and I end up having to file, let's say, a Chapter 11 petition and neither of the exceptions that you mentioned, unforeseeable circumstances or faltering business exception, uh, apply, then whether or not the debtor in possession succeeds to the worn obligations of the pre-petition debtor is going to depend, at least according to the Department of Labor, on whether the business is continuing as an ongoing entity or is in a liquidation mode? Is exactly that? right. Exactly right. Okay. And the penalties for not complying with the WARN requirements? The penalties for not complying with the WARN Act is that the employer is required to pay as damages to each aggrieved employee, that being the employees who did not receive the notice that they were supposed to receive, back pay and benefits for the period of non-compliance up to a maximum of the 60 days prior notice that they should have gotten. Well, if we're in a bankruptcy context, how do you handle that back pay obligation? What that type of priority? That, that depends that? when the notice should have been given. If the violation of the Warren Act occurred pre-petition, you have a pre-petition claim on the part of the employees. That pre-petition claim is treated as any other pre-petition claim with the exception that it may be entitled to the priority treatment that is afforded to workers' wages. It has been equated with wa a wage priority under 507. But that's three. capped by a dollar that amount. That is capped by a dollar amount, which is currently $4,650. If the failure to give notice is post-petition, the courts have been quite consistent in interpreting that damage claim by the employees to be an administrative expense priority claim. 507A1. 507A1. Let's go back to this distinction that you mentioned that the Department of Labor has drawn in its implementing regulations or interpretation about when WARN will apply in bankruptcy um, and when it will not. Um, has, has the case law that we have so far, and I understand there is some circuit case law on the issue, has the case law generally deferred to this interpretation? It has to defer to that interpretation because that interpretation has the force of law. It is a very problematic distinction as far as I'm concerned 
you could say, all right, if a company is in Chapter 7, that must mean it's liquidate. If it's in Chapter 11, that must mean it's continuing to operate the business. But of course, that's far too simplistic. A company in Chapter 7 may, in fact, continue to operate the business if that is the best way to liquidate. If you can get more value for the assets on an ongoing basis than you can by uh, an asset sale, that is exactly what the trustee should do as it's, as in fulfilling its fiduciary obligations to the creditors. In Chapter 11, we all know that you can have a liquidating Chapter 11. And in a, a liquidating Chapter 11, theoretically, you are not continuing to operate the business, and so you should fall on the other side of the Department of Labor's line. But then how do you tell if you're in Chapter 11 whether you are in a liquidating Chapter 11 or you are in a reorganizing Chapter 11? Perhaps there are circumstances, such as there was in a, in a recent case, the, the health care case, where uh, from the very inception it was clear that the company was not going to be able to reorganize. But many companies go into Chapter 11 assuming they're going to be able to reorganize and at some point during the Chapter 11 process change their collective corporate minds and turn into a liquidating Chapter 11. How do you know when that has occurred? They don't generally announce to the public, well, now we've decided we are going to be a liquidating Chapter 11. <laughs> and what if it's a sort of a creeping liquidation? where they liquidate a little bit and then try to reorganize around the rest and then they liquidate a little more, at what point does it become a liquidating Chapter 11? And what if the plan calls for the sale of the business? Is that a liquidation? Or? Certainly at that point you have an intent to liquidate, but think of what happens then. Generally, there are still employees. They are still coming into work. They are selling whatever product this particular bankrupt company manufactures or retails, you really can't say that there is no business being operated until the liquidation is complete. And you certainly can't say that at that point we will ex post facto say you didn't have to give any Warren Act notice. Laura, is, is it the case that um, there is liability for giving a Warren Act notice and then not closing down? No, there's no, no, no liability for a false start. I mean, so presumably a, uh, I mean, employees often in large businesses are, are brought together when a company files and they say, you know, we're filing for bankruptcy, this is, this is what's going to happen. Um, if they just say, and by the way, here's a Warren Act notice uh, at that time, would that help the Chapter 11? Well, the Warren Act notice has to be reasonably complete and specific as to exactly which employees are going to be affected. Congress did not want companies to be putting in sort of precatory right. Warren Act notices all the time to protect themselves in the event something bad happened in the future. But it certainly would seem that it would be wise, at least from the um, employer's perspective, to give the Warren Act notice the day before the filing because you can then, <laughs> at least based on your uh, uh, discussion of the cases, you can fairly well, fairly sure, be fairly confident that it would be a pre-petition claim rather than an administrative expense. And is that fair? That's part of the problem I have with all of this. The gamesmanship. The gamesmanship mm -hmm. of it. Why should a company who gives a notice and lays off people prior to bankruptcy be totally subject to the Warren Act, and if they wait two days and give the notice afterwards and are deemed to be a liquidating fiduciary, they have no liability whatsoever. That certainly wasn't in Congress's mind when it adopted the Warren Act. Those employees of a bankrupt company are equally in need of the notice in order to make sense of their lives. The Warren Act is a very modest piece of legislation. 60 days notice. How would any of us feel if we were told we were going to lose our jobs? Mm -hmm and not have at least 60 days notice to try to find another job, to get retraining. Congress thought this was going to save the government money. This was going to save welfare benefits. It was going to, to, to uh, enable these people to pay taxes, become productive citizens. People who are laid off in bankruptcy have exactly the same need of Warren Act notice as people outside of bankruptcy. All right, then um, let's get to the nuts and bolts. Um, given the fact that the, this Department of Labor interpretation, which you say has the force of law, how should our audience, how should bankruptcy judges,
deal with or treat uh, warning claims by employees. Well, I view the statutory requirements as a minimum. Obviously, a bankruptcy judge cannot relieve a company otherwise subject to federal law of its statutory obligations. However, I say it's a minimum. There is nothing that precludes a bankruptcy judge from requiring a bankrupt employer to give as much notice of a plant closing or mass layoff as the bankruptcy judge wishes to do. The bankruptcy judge can refuse to approve a going out of business sale or the uh, rejection of a lease at a particular facility until 60 days has passed. That's perfectly within the purview of a bankruptcy judge. The bankruptcy judge can also interpret the exceptions to war the WARN Act very narrowly. Say this is not a faltering company situ situation. This is not an unforeseeable business circumstance that a troubled company would have to close down its operations and interpret very narrowly the good faith exception, which I didn't mention, the penalties can be abated to the extent that a company uh, in good faith believed it was not subject to the WARN Act. Interpret that very narrowly as well so as to maximize the coverage of the WARN Act both in bankruptcy and outside bankruptcy. So bottom line, bankruptcy judges should not necessarily feel that their discretion has been constrained by this act and recognize that there's still the opportunity to administer the case in accordance with the broad powers that they have. That would be what I, my contention is. Very good. All right. Well, I think we've all been warned. <laughs> uh, and I wish we had more time to spend on that topic, but we do want to move along. Laura, thank you very much. Um, Michelle, we're going to turn to you next. Um, asset concealment and fraudulent transfers by individual debtors uh, continue to generate a lot of case law, although empirically it's not clear how much of a problem uh, it really is. Um, in any event, when debtors engage or are alleged to engage in that behavior, um, they do take some serious risks, potentially placing their discharge in jeopardy and maybe even facing um, criminal prosecution. On the other hand, traditionally from the trustee, usually trustee, sometimes creditor point of view, proving fraud, bad intent, is not an easy task, short of a direct admission from the debtor, which is rarely forthcoming, or a frontal lobotomy, which is rarely <laughs> permitted, right? But um, we now have at least one bankruptcy court case that may have given trustees a new weapon. Um, as I understand it, an ex parte inspection order. And that decision and that analysis takes bankruptcy lawyers and bankruptcy judges someplace most of us have not been since law school, which is Fourth Amendment search and seizure law. So let's start by, by having you tell us a little bit about what this, is, what this new weapon is all about. It's interesting that it is referred to as the ex parte inspection order, but I think if we were talking to people in the uh, Fourth Amendment criminal law, constitutional law world, they'd say it's a search warrant because that's essentially the effect of the inspection order. Uh, the Barman case, uh, which is uh, uh, cited in the materials, involves a debtor who appears to have done lots of asset concealment. Mm -hmm. It was a Chapter 7 debtor. Uh, there were vending and poker machines which uh, the debtor had in his business and they seemed to have disappeared or they, at least the trustee wasn't able to get the debtor to disclose uh, the, the location of the assets. There were also some somewhat suspicious uh, real property transfers. Three homes were involved. None of the homes were titled in the debtor's name. The first two homes were titled in the debtor's parent's name. Uh, the third one was titled in the debtor's spouse. The, not, uh, the debtor's spouse and his uh, spouse did not file for bankruptcy, filed in her name. There was uh, allegations that there was $40,000 worth of furniture in one home, potentially $5,000 of additional furniture that the debtor's parents had given him. But on his bankruptcy schedules, he listed about $500 in apparel as his sole asset. 
So certainly that would at least <coughs> suggest or trigger that there must be some sort of asset concealment that's taking place. This was a bad facts case. Right. This was a bad, horrible bad, bad, bad facts, facts case. But I would also suggest that it's probably similar to the bad facts cases that are involved in a lot of the criminal searches. That the debtor, or in that case the criminal defendant, probably did everything that the person was accused of, but sort of that, that's not the point. So but we do have horrible facts in this case, at least from the perspective of uh, trying to protect a debtor who probably doesn't need to be, uh, doesn't have, doesn't pass the smell test. Not very sympathetic. Exactly. Tell, tell us though about the nature of the order that the trustee or the wards right. that the trustee sought uh, in this case. How broad? Uh, quite broad. Uh, the trustee went to the court, again was ex parte, and essentially told the court because of all of the things that this debtor has done, or I would say alleged to have done, uh, we need to inspect his home. And we need to inspect uh, everything in his home, everywhere in his home. And so it was quite broad, at least from the perspective of, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about the, the criminal law or constitutional law um, aspects of the Barman case, but certainly in most criminal cases, the search warrants have to sort of allege the places to be searched with particularity, and you need to have some sort of allegations as to the type of property that you're looking for. Well, in the Barman case, it was a very broad order, uh, and in addition to the breadth of the order, the trustee convinced the court that I need to have a U.S. Marshal to accompany me. And so it's somewhat disheartening when you have a private lawyer uh, saying, I need to have an armed marshal to go with me, because I think the response is, well, perhaps that's something that private lawyers shouldn't be doing in a civil uh, setting. That's what we should be doing in a criminal context with people who um, are tasked to do that. But Does Michelle, he, uh, there clearly ahead. are searches outside of the criminal setting. Certainly. Yeah, there are civil searches, there are administrative searches, but in those searches it's almost always some sort of a public welfare, uh, a safety issue. You're allowed to search a, uh, a building because you think that there are fire code violations. You're allowed to, there was a, a very, a, an older Supreme Court case also cited in the materials uh, where workers under the program then called AFDC were allowed to go in to make sure that there was no harm to the children that were taking place in the home. But in this case, it's essentially a commercial dispute between creditors who want to be paid and someone who chooses either not to pay or uh, tries to find ways to hide assets to ensure that the creditors won't be paid. And you don't have the public safety kind of an exception that you see in most of the Supreme Court cases. Well, Michelle, now don't get mad at me. I just asked this question and played devil's advocate for a moment, but we have a debtor who is seeking the benefits of relief under the bankruptcy statute by submitting to an administration with all the disclosure requirements that are entailed by the statute. Does not that diminish the debtor's expectation of privacy? Privacy, certainly, but privacy in what? I mean, for example, if the, the debtor obviously is going to have to prepare the schedules and list all sorts of information in the schedules that perhaps he wouldn't ordinarily be required to disclose to the public. Public documents, anybody that wants to could go down to the court and see um, uh, Social Security number, credit card numbers. And in, sort of as an aside, I know that there's been a fair amount of controversy involved in the districts that have now gone to the electronic case filing. The concern being that now all of this information is available potentially online to the world to review, uh, as opposed to in the past where you at least physically had to go to the courthouse. So certainly a diminished expectation of privacy in the debtor's papers and in the information that the debtor includes in the papers. But there's a difference between saying anybody that wants to can go in and read about your financial history and a private attorney can come in and search your home. Uh, there's always been different treatment given to um, a debtor, a criminal defendant's rights to privacy in the home and the rights to privacy everywhere else. Well, you keep emphasizing private attorney. Mm -hmm. If this were truly a private attorney, there's no Fourth Amendment issue. Right. The only time there's a Fourth Amendment issue is if we've got state action. And the Barman case said because of the, the particular role of the trustee in this proceeding, and in fact, because he took along a U.S. Marshal, mm -hmm. that it was clear that he was acting as a as state actor. Right. So this is not a private lawyer issue. This is a state actor who is acting pursuant to a warrant, mm -hmm. a warrant that is not in a criminal proceeding. This is a civil proceeding. And 
Therefore, in order to get a warrant, he has to make a showing. He has to make a showing that the public interest in getting this search accomplished outweighs the private interest of, in this case, the debtor, mm -hmm. his interest in privacy in his own. And the judge, the bankruptcy judge, made that balance, looking at the public interest in the integrity of the bankruptcy system, in the likelihood, in this bad facts situation, that they were going to find things, which is also part of the balance, and weighing those, decided that the public interest outweighed the interest of privacy in the home. He made that balance. He sent them out on the warrant. Now, isn't it true that Judge Rhodes should have dismissed this case summarily by saying this was a civil action? What are you seeking, debtor? You're seeking exclusion of what they found. The exclusionary rule is not applicable to anything but a criminal proceeding. Well, I guess I would say the case should have been dismissed, but I would say much earlier. Because it seems to me that the distinction between it's not a criminal matter, it's a civil matter, I think is somewhat of a red herring in this case. Because the reality is whatever the trustee and the marshal and the trustee's lawyer and the appraiser found in the house was going to be turned over to, whether it's a task force or the U.S. attorney or however it works in a particular jurisdiction, which could then trigger and most likely would trigger a bankruptcy pro prosecution. And so to say that, well, it really isn't criminal, it's not criminal, it's just civil, I, I really think that's a distinction without much, uh, much of a distinction. I think what the bankruptcy court could have done and, and arguably should have done in the case was to tell the debtor, you've come to the bankruptcy court, you're relying on this federal statute, we think you're hiding assets, we think you're lying, we think you're doing whatever, and either you allow a search of your home or you're gone we're going to dismiss the case, you're, you're not going to receive the discharge. And I think that would be quite appropriate to require the debtor to consent to the search in exchange for oh, the but discharge. But Michelle, what's going to happen when he says that to the debtor? The debtor is going <coughs> to take all of those assets, move them out of his home, mm -hmm. and put them somewhere else. That's why these warrants are always ex parte. And that would be a perfectly appropriate warrant, but you characterized it as being the public interest and I suppose in any bankruptcy case, you can argue that there is a public right. interest. Well, we may, dis we may disagree court. about the balance. Right. There's no question that, that w reasonable people can disagree about the balance. And if Judge Shapiro, the bankruptcy judge, got it wrong, mm -hmm. then if, in fact, Varman is prosecuted mm -hmm. based on evidence found in his house, at that point, he can make an exclusionary right. A motion to exclude the evidence right. as as obtained in violation of his Fourth Amendment rights, right. and in that criminal proceeding, they'll decide whether Judge Shapiro did it right or wrong. Right. But that's not what was before Judge Rhodes. But I guess my argument is, and I'm not trying to pick on any particular judge, that it never should have come up in the civil side of bankruptcy. You, so, so your position, I take it, is that listen, rather than um, just ex parte going out and looking for evidence, you say, listen as long as we have some reasonable threshold of evidence that you are uh, there may be some problems here uh, this is what well, this is what's at issue this is a civil proceeding either consent to the search or you don't get a discharge and I guess that's fine and then by the way we're gonna make a referral to the US attorney mm -hmm. uh, and they can do whatever they want to do um, uh, with the case at that point point. and so your focus is this is just about the discharge this isn't about doing wrong that's the criminal side if exactly. they ever want to bring a criminal fraud action um, what this is about is the discharge, and uh, I may take it that we, we might all agree that these kind of orders just issued uh, as a matter of course in regular proceedings would not be a good thing. And so how the, I guess the question that Michelle's asking is how do you distinguish kind of any case that walks in from this case? And if you've got enough evidence to go after a warrant here, is that a different standard than denying the discharge? I mean, I guess I'm trying to see is this a, is this a halfway measure to a denial of a discharge, or is this just confirming what everybody knew? When you say confirming what everybody knew that, that he, that he, that, 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 that he had done acts which under 727 would have denied a discharge. Exactly. And I guess I would say there, there are other, I think, creative ways that a bankruptcy court could address this. For example, you could have the debtor to show up and say uh, at the hearing, uh, either you allow us to search your home or, we go, or we're going to deny you the discharge. Your concern was, well, of course, all of the, the assets are going to disappear. You can say, and we're coming by in an hour or the, uh, the trustee is at the home now, or the marshal is at the home now. I mean, there are ways that you could prevent the assets from walking out of the home or, or disappearing. 
uh, there were there were uh, to talk about bad facts. I mean, there were really bad facts in this case. You had a process server that uh, saw video games in the home. I think 15 to 20 video machines were in the home, even though he claimed he didn't have the assets. You had someone else involved in private litigation, uh, post-petition litigation with the debtor, who um, saw a trailer behind the home and that the debtor was had certain personal property in the home. But you can have someone, somebody out there with a video camera watching him or his family or his friends or whatever, removing the property in the hour that it takes to get. So I'm not suggesting that uh, there would never be an appropriate use of a search, of an inspection order in this case. But I think the way that it was handled in this case uh, really doesn't give much, um, I think the balance is off in terms of the uh, protection given to the debtor's privacy interest. Now the debtor's spouse, as I recall the facts, did consent. Right. Does that alter your um, opinion at all of the appropriateness of what ultimately transpired? A, a non-debtor. A non-debtor. debtor gave consent. But a spouse no. who resided at the property, right? Uh, well, to the extent that it was a, uh, a criminal search, uh, I, I'm not sure that saying that the non-defendant would be able to consent to something that would then be used against the defendant. I'm not as familiar, obviously, with the criminal cases as I am with the bankruptcy cases, uh, but it seems to me that you're, if, you're, if you're concerned about the assets leaving, that there are other ways that you can handle it short of so showing up at someone's home. And there was some dispute in the case about consent, but I think that the debtors prospered probably did consent. Uh, but there are other ways that you can address it short of having a marshal, an armed marshal show up with the trustee and the appraiser and debtors and a trustee's counsel to search the home. Michelle, it, it, has the Department of Justice weighed in on this? Because it seems to me the point that, that Lauren brought up, which is which is very good, that you might, you might going to have an, another hearing in a future criminal case. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that if in fact you push this civil warrant too far, you're going to wind up screwing up the criminal case because you will do stuff that uh, might be okay in a civil setting but then when it gets to the time to prosecute the person criminally which is really it seems to be the interest we seem to be vindicating mm -hmm. here that that evidence will have been tainted mm -hmm. um, and I just do you know of any action by the Department of Justice on that point? No. And also the other point that I would add is that the um, the US trustees office is sort of particip or I think developing a pilot program to look at a number of initiatives somewhat in response to the um, uh, bankruptcy legislation to see well what can we do if there really is all of this fraud and asset concealment to somewhat go back to your initial comment Larry that is there empirically is there a lot of uh, asset concealment that's actually taking place uh, not surprisingly there is nothing in the uh, initiative that suggests that they're now going to be actively pursuing ex parte or any sort of inspection orders. Instead, they're focusing in on the uh, remedies that are currently available. Let's des deny the discharge. Right. Let's go after it from a bankruptcy fraud prosecution, but not to really go this far into the criminal law arena. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think what you're suggesting is on the facts of this case, the trustee probably fairly easily could have gotten to where he wanted to get revocation of the discharge <clears throat> without resorting to this fairly extraordinary uh, remedy. And if, in fact, there's a second bite at the apple, if there's a criminal prosecution to seek to suppress what was uh, obtained during the course of the inspection, then tactically it may have been a very poor decision right. to seek the order in the, uh, in the first place. To receive it in the first place, right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our foray into uh, Fourth Amendment <laughs> law. I don't know when we'll be um, back, but it will be interesting to see. Uh, if there's more case law on this or whether the pilot program seeks to expand trustees' powers to, uh, to include that type of uh, authority. Well, we want to turn to our third topic now, which is a very different uh, topic, uh, asset securitization, perhaps the uh, most rapidly expanding segment of the U.S. credit markets. And indeed, about a year ago, we did a segment on this show dealing with the impact that we anticipated revised Article 9 was going to have in making the world safe for <laughs> asset securitization. Well, revised Article 9 is now here, but one thing revised Article 9 did not do was it did not change the analysis for distinguishing sale versus loan, basically left it a facts and circumstances uh, sort of test. Well. 
since that last segment that we did on this program, uh, we've had some case law. And now Congress is at least hinting that they might turn uh, the dial uh, a notch or two in, in providing uh, more protection uh, for securitization. So um, in light of the fact that uh, securitizations are becoming so popular, in light of the fact that Chapter 11 filings seem to be um, tweaking up just a bit and may continue, uh, we anticipate that bankruptcy judges are going to be seeing um, more and more of these securitization transactions. There may even be a couple in the Enron bankruptcy case, and therefore we thought it quite appropriate to bring back um, if not the leading expert in the country on this subject, certainly the leading expert at this table. So, Bruce, um, I'll take the last. Where are we at? Um, thanks, Larry. What I want to do is uh, basically three and maybe four things. One, I want to talk a little bit about the phenomenon of securitization, and try and walk th us through kind of a, a standard transaction. Um, and I think I need to do that because the real point I want to make is there are some frailties in the structures that are currently used, some legal frailties. Uh, and I think you have to understand the structure a little bit to understand kind of what the current debate is about. And then, as you indicated, I want to talk about how bankruptcy courts might see these issues brought to them. Because there's a, there's a um, the one thing about securitization, it's designed to avoid bankruptcy. Uh, from the get-go, that's the purpose. It, the purpose is to try and to get to a transaction that can be priced on the basis of not having bankruptcy. And so to actually talk about how it would get into bankruptcy seems a little bit odd, but I think there are some ties I want to make that. And then I want to end with a little discussion about uh, the section you referenced in the Reform Bill, Section 912, which you said would turn the dial, I think it would take the dial off um, uh, of these types of transactions. First, what is securitization? Depending on who you listen to, it's either a $2 trillion or a t $10 trillion, with a T, um, industry. It is global. It is the wave of high finance that had, that, although it's as old as Ginnie Mae certificates, the real crest hasn't happened until the last five to ten years. And the type of transactions that happen here, again, arise in part because of the great rise in pension assets in this country. All those assets need some place to go to earn money. And so uh, the mavens on Wall Street came up with an idea of securitization. And what securitization is, in essence, is lending on the assets of a company without worrying about the bankruptcy of that company. And what I've done, uh, hopefully, that will show up on the screen and also in the materials is to give a couple charts to indicate a structure, or a, a common structure called a two-tiered structure, uh, and then to walk through that structure again with a recent transaction actually just closed this week, which is the last week of, of January, um, and then to use that as a springboard to talk about it. So. In chart A, what I have is, I mean, it looks like someone threw spaghetti on the piece of paper, but what really I have here. We weren't going to mention that. that the, <laughs> I, I understand, but I, I, I'll, I can try and make it. Actually, it's, they're more complicated than these charts would indicate, which is part of the mystique behind it. It's kind of hard to penetrate it. In essence, securitization, as I've said before in other contexts, is really nothing more than factoring on steroids. What we're doing is we're taking um, receivables or some type of payment obligation bundling it up, transferring it in a sale to another entity, and then getting paid for it. Well, that's all fine and good. If I sell you my car and I file bankruptcy next week, uh, nobody would think normally <coughs> excuse me, that um, the trustee could go after the car in your hands. It was a sale, after all. As long as it was a fair price. Fair, yeah, a fair price. You, know, you took all the risk of ownership. But um, if I lent the car to you for as long as I was in bankruptcy with the idea that I'd get it back, maybe the trustee could go after it or maybe there, there wasn't the economic risk. We've seen this uh, in the sale-lease distinction um, uh, in, in, uh, in great numbers uh, under the UCC, and that's kind of the issue here. Well, what happens is, is that, and, and again, securitization has its own lingo. The company, what we would call the debtor, is called the originator. It's the person who originates the receivables. They then take those and package those and sell them, and there's going to be a couple sales here. They all occur simultaneously, so you have to kind of keep them all in your mind at once. They sell them to a company they create wholly for that purpose. And that company is usually a wholly owned subsidiary. Um, and the articles of incorporation of the bylaws all say that it can't file bankruptcy. Uh, the, the people, the sponsors, the underwriters of the transaction ensure that uh, the organizing, organizational documents indicate that uh, you have to have a supermajority to file, and they always make sure that they have enough directors to prevent that. 
In essence, this is the so-called bankruptcy remote notion. Uh, and so you sell it to them. And then in the two-tier transaction, that entity turns around and sells it again to another entity, usually structured as a tax pass-through entity, a trust, a partnership, an LLC, something like that. And that is the entity that then borrows money, if you will, from the public issuing notes. Uh, and so we've had the receivables drop down into a subsidiary, sell across to the trust, and then they borrow money. Now, the thing about receivables and payment obligations, they're self-liquidating. As they pay out, then the money comes in. And so these transactions are structured. So as the money comes in, the money is paid out. Now, if it's a sale, then each entity along the way takes the risk of ownership. If you uh, transfer them at a price which doesn't cover all the ultimate collections, the buyer ought to suffer the consequences. Conversely, if you sold them for too low a price, then the buyer gets the benefit. Um, and that's kind of the, the kernel of the true sale uh, notion. What happens in these transactions, however, is that the transaction from the first, uh, from the first entity, sometimes called a special purpose vehicle, the subsidiary to the trust, um, they will sell the receivables, usually at a discount, but then they will take back from that entity some type of instrument, a subordinated note, that will completely consume the receivables. So what happens is, is that if the originator says, well, you know, I'll sell you these, but I want to make sure that if I got too low a price, I capture them back. They're my receivables after all. They'll say, fine, you give us $100 receivable, we'll give you a $90 loan. And they're doing this through this kind of remote entity. Well, what, the way they capture the extra $10, they'll then take a $10 subordinated note from that entity so that if, in fact, the receivables pay out too much um, or they collect at a higher rate than people thought, they can simply take that money back as it collects out. So the real economic risk in these transactions doesn't necessarily pass in the same way that we would think in a normal sale. You can see that in chart B, which is an example of a transaction from a financially, as far as I know, a financially solvent company, Honda Motor. Honda Motor uh, is big in securitization. They have over $10 billion of securitizations. And that tends to be where a lot of these securitizations are. They're in car loans, credit card receivables, and the like. Let me stop you. Sure. We need to get this on the table. Why does the originator, what we would right. call the debtor, um, why do they want to go through this complicated right. structure in lieu of simply a loan against uh, receivables or other assets? That, if you will, is the $10 billion question or the $2 trillion question. What has happened is that uh, the, f the, the financiers have convinced themselves that uh, they can loan a lower rate of interest if there's no bankruptcy risk. And so if this transaction is structured so that if the originator files, uh, the investors uh, don't have to worry about the automatic stay. If they don't have to worry about ultimate payment, then they can give a better interest rate to the debtor. And of course, the debtor's going to go along with that because it's, this is cheaper financing than they can get from banks and other traditional avenues of corporate finance, uh, even sometimes cheaper than they can get from um, uh, floating commercial paper on their own. So this type of transaction, and this type of transaction has arisen uh, because people think that it provides a lower cost financing for these larger uh, entities that can afford to do this. And it keeps growing. I mean, the, auto, the autos are a traditional notion of it, but there, there are some very exotic. For example, they have securitized discharge bankruptcy debt. Now, huge discount. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, you're not you're not talking about paying anything like a dollar for dollar, but you know, we all know that some debtors will voluntarily pay, and if you can calculate it, uh, you can securitize it. I mean, you can, you know, if it moves or changes, you can securitize it basically, and that's a little bit what's going on here. And you see that a little bit in the Honda Motor thing. What Honda did in using the same structure is to sell face about 2.08 billion dollars uh, worth of receivables ultimately receiving $2.03 billion uh, in cash. Big transaction. The difference, the .05, which is actually $50 million, not small change for most of us, um, is going to be taken back as subordinated notes. So just like I had said before, this transaction winds up with Honda getting local, uh, basically a secured loan uh, for $2.03 uh, billion, and then getting collecting out on the, with respect to the subordinated notes, whatever would be in excess. This is uh, the 52 or 50 uh, million is a 2.5 percent uh, discount. That is to say, they're getting 97.5 percent of uh, what they're selling. Now that's because Honda's good. Other, entity, other transactions, and by the way, these transactions are on the web. You can go to Booties 
Standard & Poor's website, they will just they list these data. That's how I got the information here. Another transaction which didn't fit as well for this was budget, which right now is having some financial difficulties. Their discount was 20%. So for every $80 or every $100, excuse me, of car rental obligations, they were going to get $80 back, and they were then going to take to take the uh, example further, $20 uh, in subordinated notes. Now, all of this is driven in large part by getting a rating on the investments because, again, I mentioned earlier the pension. Uh, funds, they want to get high rated. And all of these things tend to be driven towards investment grade rating. That's why there's all these uh, discounts and some cash collateral. Well, heavily into this process are Moody's, Standard & Poor's, Fitch, the rating agencies. And you can actually go on the web and they will tell you what they require from lawyers and from structuring. They will tell you what the legal opinions that the originator debtor's counsel has to give has to say. You, for, for example, they say, and this will be in the materials as well, that you cannot say it's not free from doubt uh, or that, that it's more likely than not that a judge will hold this. They're actually requiring lawyers to say courts will hold that these transactions will withstand scrutiny. Brings me to my next point, will they? Well, we've seen a little bit already in the LTV case that uh, this type of structure may not be immune or impervious. Now, what happens is, is because this is structured to avoid bankruptcy, you try and, and make sure there are no points of contact between the bankers. In essence, they've sold the receivables. They're not owned by the debtor. In LTV, they did what most people think is kind of, if you will, the first wave of attacks. They say, listen, we all know that under Article 9 and, and other laws, whether it's a sale or a loan is a substantive, not a formal distinction. And so substantively in LTV, I think they had something like $420 million of receivables against which they had, they had bought, if you will, for $380 million. And so for that difference, LTV said, we think we really have the ownership. We want to use those receivables as cash collateral. And so they brought an ex parte cash collateral motion, in essence, bringing in a bank who thought it was an owner, not a lender, mm -hmm. and said, we want to use this as cash collateral. Well, tremendous number of procedural problems in LTV, and thus it's not a particularly good um, ultimate decision. But the judge there, very, I think, very properly said, uh, and this is something I want to look at, and so I'm going to temporarily let you use cash flow. I want you to bring in the evidence, and we'll take a look at it in a little bit, but, you know, let's do this in a quick time frame. Well, they settled. I mean, they rolled over this into a debtor in possession financing, so we don't have any definitive rulings, and that's kind of the only the tip of the iceberg. But more and more companies, large companies, have securitized their credit card receivables, have securitized their inventory. You know. Is there anything in here? Inherently, I mean, you're talking about some transactions right. where there's been, I would describe perhaps some corruption of the right. process because the true indicia of ownership right. really haven't changed hands. Uh, and I think the, the sale-lease cases are, are a good analogy uh, to that. Uh, but is there in cheaper, lower cost of credit right. is a good thing without getting right. into the argument about the efficiency or non-efficiency of secured debt. I think we all agree with that. Um, if there's fair value and, and the risks and rights of ownership pass, is there anything, I mean, these assets are outside now the bankruptcy estate, right. not available as cash collateral, not subject to the stay, but is there in anything inherently nefarious about asset securitization? I don't think so, but you know, it's, it's like saying, is there anything nefarious in your family? You may have a cousin or two that are, uh, that are pretty bad. Or, we don't or, want to go or, there. Or a weird <laughs> uncle. But you know, for the most part, you know, if it is, in fact, a true sale, and, and these kind of incidents of ownership do pass, absolutely nothing wrong with it. Each stage, you can say that it's fine. The problem is that when you have these type of structure, and then you say, uh, well, since each stage alone looks good, we don't have to stand back and look at the whole thing. That's the problem. I think if you look at this generally, Who's getting hurt? It's going to be the unsecured creditors of the originator. Instead of having kind of the recourse to the businesses going, at most they're going to have the, ability, the, the ownership interest in a subsidiary that may have a subordinated note uh, on the back end. And so you have passed, without really compensation, the unsecured creditors, a far greater risk to them. Uh, and maybe that's, that's, that's the point. Someone who likes securitization would say, well, that's the low cost financing. That's, I mean, we're going to, of course, we're going to put that on the unsecured creditors. That's where it always happens. The trouble is, is this really hasn't been kind of up and above board. As I indicated, I think every major law from the country has issued securitization opinions. And again, under the standard and poor guidelines, they don't have a lot of discretion in what they can say. Indeed, the latest is, uh, I think it's either Moody's or Standard and Poor's, are putting the, the exact paragraphs they want to see 
in the in either the opinion letters or the agreements. Otherwise, they won't rate the deal. They don't rate the deal. No one buys it. Now, there's another wave or possible wave of attack uh, on these that we may see and we may not. And actually, I think in some respects, it's it's more problematic because I think you might be able to get around some of the true sale issues. And that's substantive consolidation. We know substantive consolidation is not something that's expressed in the terms of the statute. If you want to situate it anywhere, it's Section 105. Um, it is a doctrine which you can consolidate two debtors. You can consolidate a debtor with a non-debtor. One of the first U.S. Supreme Court cases on this, Sam Sell, consolidated a non-debtor with a debtor. And one way to look at this is to step back, as, as I said, and say, you know, the economic risks haven't part. These are, this is all part of the one entity. I mean, one thing I didn't mention earlier is often the originator debtor continues to service the receivables after they've been sold. So from the, the, the car buyer's perspective, it's still Honda. You know, from, from the economic risk position, it's still Honda. I think those arguments, uh, given the uh, admittedly uncertain state of substantive consolidation law, could pose some very big problems down the road for uh, some securitizations. Now, the problem is, is that you have to get from the filing of the reorganization to the point where you can bring that. Because that's going to be a fact-intensive, uh, difficult uh, uh, theory to prove. Um, and debtors may not have that much time. I think overall, though, it might be the better of the two. And not surprisingly, these are the types of opinions that Standard and Poor's and Moody's require. They require a true sale opinion for each sale down the line. They require a substantive consolidation opinion down the line. And if you take a look at these opinions, and I've had some, you know, some of my good friends on the, on the corporate side send them to me, you will, you, these are 40 to 50 page opinions that are wonderful textbook examples. The trouble is that we have all of these lawyers passing these transactions, these rating agencies, we never had the court system look at them. Uh, we have everyone kind of guessing what the court system will do without necessarily involving kind of a neutral uh, judge who has the interests of all parties at heart, which is really the essence of the doctrines that we're talking about in terms but of Bruce, true But Bruce, the sale. whole point of this is to avoid having to have a judge involved right. in each of these transactions. If you sell your car, no matter what you get for it, whether the, the buyer overpays for it, underpays for it, that car is not going to be subject to your bankruptcy. You've sold it. Right. The problem is accounts receivable are not subject to physical delivery to the right. purchaser. They are still going to be this amorphous thing that it's going to collect. Now, you've agreed that a classic factoring operation where the actual risks and rewards of collecting those receivables has actually been transferred, that's a true sale. Right. Would you agree that should not be subject to review uh, by, by a judge? Well, uh, no, I wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. So you, you, you don't think that any sort, of, well, any sort of sale of intangible assets should be, be able to be accomplished and immunized from the bankruptcy system? No, because, again, if we go, go back to state law, one of the reasons that Article 9 covers more than just secure transactions, it covers the sale of accounts. It covers I understand the sale. That. is because it's too hard to tell the difference. And one of the things, uh, that to me means it's always substance over form. I would resist any attempt to say that, that lawyers, uh, through all their craft, can construct barriers of form that will not allow the bankruptcy court to get to the substance. I mean, the bankruptcy court has jurisdiction to do all sorts of things that it never does because it usually doesn't seem economically worthwhile to do so. But uh, just because there has been, if I have a sale of a car to Larry and then I file, the bankruptcy trustee and the bankruptcy judge have, have all the ability to look into that transaction if it was a preference, if it was a fraudulent transfer. Why shouldn't they look into it if it was a true sale? And they can today. Uh, right. Certainly, judges have the authority to collapse what you describe as right. a step transaction right. and look at the entirety and try to get to the economic reality of the um, transaction. Uh, Section 912, though, right. would severely limit that discretion. Section Can we talk about that? For sure. Just a Section 912 is uh, part of the current pending bankruptcy bill, H.R. 333, which, as we sit here, is in conference. Uh, it's in the financial netting provisions, although it has nothing to do with financial netting. What Section 912 does, in essence, is to say if you have a securitization transaction that involves receivables, like we've said here, they call them financial assets, in which securities are, are issued, and in which a nationally recognized securities rating agency rates them investment grade or better, those assets are forever excluded from the originator's bankruptcy estate. Because 912 is, a, is an amendment to 541 of the code, which deals with property of the estate. 
And so what happens is, is that if you get Moody's or Standard Poor's to give you an investment grade rating, then those asset, then we do have an iron gate that drops down that doesn't allow the bankruptcy judge to go beyond it and say, under old law, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's very odd. It doesn't become property of the estate, doesn't get rid of the state law distinctions uh, between sale and uh, lease or sale and um, kind of lease back or whatever these are. Uh, so it, it, it'll be interesting in operation. And it actually doesn't necessarily, although people will disagree on the reading of this, doesn't necessarily bar the substantive consolidation issue either. It does limit the fraudulent transfer, right. but your substantive consolidation sort of backup right. would still potentially be on the table. Yeah, now a substantive consolidation, there are at least two, if not three lines of cases, uh, especially at the circuit level with that. And a lot of the cases will look at prejudice to creditors. If in fact, because you almost always, when you combine estates, you're gonna, you're gonna hurt the creditors and the asset, ri asset richer estate and, and, and vice versa. Um, to the extent that comes in, there's gonna be some interesting issues because I think everybody to these transactions understands and knows these risks if they read these 40 or 50 page opinions. The question is, is that enough of an, is that enough notice that was at risk that you don't have to worry about their, quote, prejudice if you collapse the transaction, mm -hmm. or whether there really is some true prejudice here in terms of entering into these transactions. That remains to be seen. I mean, the, it's hard to underestimate, because say around this table we all kind of think of bankruptcy and we kind of accept it. It's hard to underestimate the, the sheer loathing that most of the people in the financial industry have for bankruptcy. They call the automatic state of the bankruptcy tax uh, on transactions. Um, and th those, those in the audience and those here who work with people from other countries, um, you know, they think our bankruptcy system is loony. At one point in the, in the early uh, 90s, uh, the European Union tried to have Chapter 11 declared an unfair business practice uh, as, it, as it related to airlines. I mean, th th there's a lot of sentiment going against this. And the other thing that's happening, uh, Larry, regardless of whether 912 passes or not, securitization is really going global. One of the things that you see is that uh, in emerging economies, the ability to securitize um, uh, payment streams, toll road streams, power streams, telephone, is a, is a major way a lot of emerging economies are bolstering their infrastructure. And the types of transactions that are coming out, I mean, the small secret, I know a lot about the bankruptcy laws of other countries and I, um, because I read the Standard & Poor's website, because they, will, they, will, they have these research papers on what the law of other countries means and can do to securitization. You learn a lot. I mean, there's a tremendous amount invested in this and a tremendous amount to bring America in line with the rest of the world. So this is an issue that's going to be here for a while. Well, the efforts to contract out and around bankruptcy will probably continue unabated, and the efforts to resist uh, will continue in the same fashion, and I suspect that uh, uh, that particular dialectic will go on uh, for the rest of our lives. Unfortunately, uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, I do want to thank uh, all three of our guests uh, for coming in to explore uh, and explain these important uh, issues for us. Uh, we hope you found it informative and worthwhile. And finally, I want to remind our viewers to please fill out the one-page evaluation form that's on the FJC website and fax it back to us at the number at the bottom of the form. It really is the only way for us to know if you found this program useful and informative. For the Federal Judicial Television Network, I'm Lawrence Poneroff. Thanks for watching.